Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence goes to my guest, and this time someone I whose work I know well and actually know personally, uh, a uh, former president or retired president, um, not president, <laughs> retired <laughs> professor at Cal State Hayward. Uh, sorry, it's still early for me, and uh, but who has written some of the maybe the most important certainly among the most important books about uh, Native American culture, life, and oppression uh, in the United States. It's a long list, uh, and we've done podca podcasts before, but I want to talk to you now. Uh, hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Roxanne, uh, Roxanne Dumbar-Ortiz and uh, Professor. And I, I want to interrogate, that's a word they use in the communications field where I teach, the, the concept of settler colonialism. And when I first encountered this, I thought, well, that's a pretty accurate description of what happened in the United States and in other parts of the world where, uh, you know, a, a powerful uh, external population enters the situation, takes it over and forms a colonial rule. And uh, when it was applied to Native Americans, you know, most people seem to accept that as an accurate description, wasn't a source of controversy. However, when it got applied by uh, some uh, no, significant number of scholars uh, to Israel's occupation of, uh, you know, where Palestinians had long lived in the West Bank and Gaza and, uh, and, and actually parts of Israel, uh, uh, the current Israel, uh, suddenly it became associated with anti-Semitism, uh, irrational. People could be fired over it, rechallenged. So I, the reason I, I wanted to talk to you is, yes, it's Thanksgiving and we should make comments and, and analyze what happened to our native population. But really, I would like to also, why don't you tell us about this idea of settler colonialism? Where did it come from in the academic world, and, and how do you feel about it? And how do you, finally, how do you apply it to what's going on right now with uh, Israel and, and the Palestinian people? Thanks. You know, actually, I learned uh, about settler colonialism before I <clears throat> had applied it to the United States. And I learned from two people, one, a Palestinian, um, that I met at the University of Oklahoma, and two, um, uh, Martin Legasic, um, a South African, uh, Anglo, white, South African, born and raised there four generations, I think. And um, he was one of the main uh, anti-apartheid academics, and we went to UCLA together. Um, and... It was interesting because I didn't immediately apply it at all to the United States um, uh, until until much later, you know, when I became a full-fledged historian. And, uh, and because of what was happening in Israel, the, you know, just the behavior was very much like a... Uh, a settler state. It's inherently violent. It has to be because it has to oppress the usually majority population that the idea is to um, do away with them completely. And this was practiced, of course, you know, in the United States, a hundred year war in the uh, 19th century. I call it the hundred year war from founding to um, the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890, uh, when Indian resistance was was uh, uh, no longer possible because they were locked up into reservations with armies around them. So they began, you know, of course, in the 20th century, resisting um, uh, by legal means, as we've seen the Palestinians try to do. And of course, the Palestinians have had access to the UN. And I, I've done a lot of work at the UN as a non-governmental human rights um, volunteer, you know, never paid job, but starting in 1977, when um, 
the uh, International Indian Treaty Council took the Sioux Treaty to the um, uh, United Nations and we built, you know, we built a, um, um, a uh, uh, many, many uh, parts of the UN now have these meetings and there's a general assembly of native people that brings about um, now about 20,000 people annually, the largest meeting in the United Nations at headquarters. So uh, we, um, we always at the UN, working with the Treaty Council and with other organizations, um, were in support of Palestine and um, statehood. You know that that uh, this was you know still the the agreement of um, of statehood establishing statehood. So we kept learning. There was a um, the first representative we met uh, from the PLO was uh, the uh, Terze, who was older. He was probably I think about going on seven day back in 1977 when he met, we met him. And he was, uh, uh, he was an immigre, you know, uh, leaving the, you know, he, his family was uh, pushed out uh, in 1948 and they settled in Brazil. So he was also Portuguese speaking, a very wonderful man. He just, he was so good about, I mean, they had their, of course, their serious problems, but so patiently sitting down with all of us and teaching us how to use the UN instruments of the UN. They were very practiced by then. Um, so I learned so much just on a one-to-one -one basis with the diplomats. And then when I spent a year in Geneva uh, at the UN, um, all of the European Palestinian diplomats, who at that time in the 1980s, uh, I don't know if you remember the assassinations um, that uh, Israel ordered to fight, to kill every Palestinian diplomat. And they killed, um, I don't know, a dozen or so. They were great, effective diplomats, and I knew some of them. So when um, the Palestinian delegate, um, he was not, you know, the PLO would not allow him to ride buses, only, only taxis that, where he knew the taxi driver to come back and forth in Geneva. And he had to walk alone uh, so that if he was shot at, it wouldn't, you know, kill anyone else. And, I walked with him because I said, I'm ready to die with you, you know, because uh, so I often accompanied him, you know, walking to his um, uh, after the UN and listening to his experiences and stories. I think his family were um, refugees in Germany. So or France, yeah, in France, he was French speaking. So that, you know, my own experience has just been very personal and, and upfront from 1956 when I, I met uh, uh, Saida Balukan um, at Oklahoma University. So I read What Price Israel, which was published during that time and is still one of the best books on um, A.J. Lilienthal, a Jewish uh, actually a Jewish um, academic uh, who predicted everything that's happened now in that book. Well, the, you were there then a year before the uh, so-called Six-Day War, uh, which was a preemptive war. I, I think the right. record is pretty clear now, uh, or claimed to be a preemptive war by Israel facing what they said was a, and, and it was a, there was an army of Egypt and Jordan. They had state power. They had some backing from other Arab countries. I'm not Syria sure I understand. had the Golan Heights and so forth. Uh, and the irony of that, uh, and I wanted to want to ask you about this assassination business because actually I'm not 
familiar with that. Uh, but the irony of the current situation is that Israel uh, justification of the Six Day War was that they faced an existential threat from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and other Arab countries. The Palestinian population, uh, the part that existed in what was then Israel, uh, I went there right after the Six Day War, and a number of those people that I interviewed had actually given their blood to the Israeli army, and they basically supported the, the government, and they actually thought uh, that their uh, compatriots living in Egyptian-occupied Gaza Strip and Jordanian-occupied West Bank uh, might actually fare better with the uh, labor government of, of Israel. It's a far cry from Netanyahu. That was a, an, an illusion. Uh, and, and the irony is that the Palestinians had not fought against Israel. Uh, they were, in effect, uh, an occupied people in the sense that they had no statehood. And they are the only people that were held accountable by Israel, which made a peace with Egypt, made a peace with Jordan. So it's such a distorted history. But again, there are pieces of it that, you know, I think I followed as closely. Tell me, you're saying that when you were working there at the UN, there was an active Israeli program to assassinate the Palestinian leadership? Yeah, it was uh, actually a movie was made about it, which was a pro-Israeli movie. And I can't remember um, what the name of it was. It was a, you know, it was a kind of blockbuster movie back uh, in probably late 80s um, wow. that was uh, bragging on it, you know, that these were terrorists, of course, they they uh, always, <clears throat> Israeli governments always uh, referred to Palestinians as terrorists and almost subhuman. Um, it's very much like settler colonialism in the United States. As in the, it, inherent in settler colonialism <laughs> is genocide because it, it wants to uh, destroy or completely control um, every aspect of life of the people they push off, you know, and they hopefully the United States was the most effective settler colonial state ever in terms of the genocide of the reducing the native population hugely. Um, but if you really look at it, I was, I was, I'm not very good at mathematics, but I was actually looking at percentages the percentage of the Palestinian population um, it, that, you know, that is being extinguished is not that far off, you know, from the native population. It's not so much death um, always, but simply um, people having to leave, you know, uh, to live, you know, to exist. Uh, so moving out to the U.S. and Europe and various places. So there are so many people in the diaspora uh, who all work for Palestine, you know, favor Palestine, are activists, but they're not there on the ground. And I think that's what Israel's goal is to make it so difficult to live there. They would just all leave. And that that is the goal of settler colonialism is, and I say, you know, I've also studied the, uh, with, I, I got a actually got a diploma in international human rights and humanitarian law. And one of the things is Strasbourg. Um, it's, a, it's a special um, program that, that uh, you get a diploma in it. And one of the um, things I learned uh, about very deeply is um, the Genocide Convention. And it so much applies to what's happening there right now. We are on television watching genocide being played out. And it's, you go look at, um, you know, the many, many movies made about European genocide, Nazi genocide. It's, um, uh, you know, it, it, ha it resonates. Um, what you see and the language of people, you know, of, of um, 
government officials have been genocidal um, in this, you know, during, uh, since October 7th. They just outright say they we want them to leave. To they they want to clean out Gaza, not let people come back. I think so that they have to go somewhere else. And so it's it's very serious. And I don't use genocide as uh, lightly as as a description of something. I think there have been um, very few actual genocides. It's genocide, you know, some people think there was genocide in, um, in Cambodia, but actually the, the, the only genocide charges by the International Tribunal for genocide were the ethnic minorities because it has to be a group, um, a, a group that is persecuted by another group. Uh, so the Cambodians were was a you know was a um, civil war among themselves, uh, actually one sided, uh, and definitely. You're talking about the Pol Pot massacre. Yes, and and, people, and they yeah. were punished for war crimes. You know these were war crimes, but not genocide because genocide is exactly what Israel is doing, exactly what the United States did exactly what the British did in Northern Ireland. And, um, you know, initially back in the 16th century of, of bringing Scots and Welch and, and, and English settlers to simply, uh, it, you know, telling them they can just push out the Irish farmers, small farmers, and take their land. And then the Irish... Uh, the indigenous Irish were working as sharecroppers and no longer had land, and that's why Northern Ireland today is still it's still a, an issue. These things don't go away easily, you know, because the um, uh, and in South Africa, uh, the genocide of the, 1948 is when both Israel and uh, the Afrikaner um, uh, apartheid governments took power and uh, became, you know, the South Africa was already a state, uh, but they divided, they put uh, Native people on um, banter stands so that they became the majority population. They made them little statelets and have to be careful, you know, about statehood. Uh, Palestinians have been very careful because they really studied the South African apartheid um, genocide and um, don't want to be in that position of just having a little, you know, Bantistan's their own state. Whereas the, so when people say, um, you know, talk about the two state solution, well, here's Palestine without an army, without even a, a you know, an armed resistance movement other than Hamas, which is a um, weak, uh, although armed, you know, is it because it's uh, so fundamentalist Muslim, you know, and and not, you know, a Hamas government is, um, but it's the only thing we have right now. You know, so let me that. let me push back a little bit. Uh, I, I'm here to try to understand settler colonialism, and I think. The word genocide uh, is not just the ethnic cleansing, another phrase that's used where you, I shouldn't say not just, I mean, making people refugees and risking their lives and killing them by forced travel and exodus, uh, if you want the biblical uh, reference, is, uh, you know, uh, not child's play. It, it, it leads to the destruction of a people whether you call it reservations or you put them in the Sinai desert. Uh, and, you know, if that's the goal to drive, get Egypt to go along and you suddenly have 2.3 million Palestinians living out in the desert uh, and eventually they will die from illness and, and so forth. But I will concede that what the Germans did uh, the, 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 uh, under the Nazi leadership, the deliberate killing of 
vast numbers of, of the other, the Jew. Uh, okay, we don't have to, I, at this moment, I, I don't want to explore genocide. And, and I can understand why that word raises a, a red flag. However, uh, well, I don't that's... understand. Let, I, I understand. Uh, you can push back too, but I know a limited time here. I actually want to get to this idea of settler colonialism, because I think the objection to settler colonialism is that it's all too accurate, and and and, uh, and, it, and therefore the people who are presenting a, a propagandistic view. Of, of Israel's needs and security and so forth. They don't like that phrase because it, it, it so obviously um, fits, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and I want to bring it back to the experience of Native Americans because we're talking about a, a very common phenomena that involves the dehumanization of people, a denial of their culture, a denial of, in the case of Native Americans, that they had a complex uh, culture that preserved the earth. You've written uh, books about this. You're one of the leading authorities. And, and, and I think that fit of settler colonialism is objected to so vociferously because it's, it's really difficult to deny its accuracy. Okay, well, the thing is that Settler colonialism is inherently genocidal, so you have to talk about the Genocide Convention. Okay. okay. When the Genocide Convention wasn't wasn't uh, uh, drawn up, and you can read every every part of it, uh, it it's uh, taking children from the group. They don't have to kill. In fact, you don't have to kill anyone to commit genocide under that convention, and that was very very. Uh, um, uh, in, intentional because you had a history of pogroms against Jews from the Middle Ages. And so what um, Lincoln, Lincoln, uh, Ralph Lincoln, uh, who uh, wrote the Genocide Convention, um, a Polish jurist, Jewish, uh, who escaped the Holocaust uh, by getting to Scandinavia. Can they, you give us the name again? Uh, Ralph Lincoln, L-E-N-K-I-N. He was the, he brought it up to the UN and he was the main uh, person who wrote, wrote it. So taking children from the group, you know, like the Indian boarding schools, that's, uh, that, that's an act of genocide forcibly taking them with the intent of not allowing them to go out back. So boarding schools fit perfectly within that in Canada and the United States, also Australia and New Zealand. Um, but also um, uh, creating conditions that make it impossible for the group to remain an entity, you know, with its own organizational um, principles. Uh, so there are five acts of genocide, and none of them required death necessarily. Although killing is one of one of five, that's one aspect of genocide. So it's very important that this genocide convention isn't the worst crime ever committed, which was the Holocaust. It, it is the worst crime ever committed in a space of time, in a limited space of time. You have um, a century it took to create the genocide, you know, the long genocide of Native Americans. But it, it, it's, it is, but the Genocide Convention covers that. The only thing is the United States didn't ratify it till, um, or Congress didn't approve, Senate didn't approve it. Truman um, ratified it. Uh, Truman signed it. But Congress, in their discussions, were afraid that slavery, you know, black people would um, uh, charge genocide internationally, or or the Indians who were killed off. They, you can look, you know, I have the um, the um, uh, Senate records that that had these conversations. They're public information. Um, so it was 1988. Reagan, you would 
think that was strange, but he was very good friends with uh, Duke Majin, who was the governor of California at the time. And Duke Majin, because of the Ar- he was Armenian, the Armenian genocide, uh, he convinced Reagan to um, push the Senate uh, to um, to sign it, to ratify it. So, but nothing before that that the United States has done is covered by the Genocide Convention. So they put it off enough. Although I do think there are conditions now in the United States that can be that could be. Um, just the, you know, the, um, um, the effects of the earlier genocide still live in uh, current conditions. And Native people have no, um, no permanent authority. They own, do not own the land they're on, on reservations, that much atrophied land that was uh, finally granted to them. Um, they don't own it. It's in trust. All it would take is um, is Congress passing a bill saying it no longer exists. Native people are not Native people anymore. They're just U.S. citizens, which what it was what well, Reagan recommended. <laughs> Why can't they just Reagan join rec- us? Reagan rec- I'm sorry, well, Reagan recommended. Well, when Reagan um, visited uh, the Soviet Union and he went and spoke to uh, one of the universities, um, a question came up, you know, uh, what, it, what does he think of the, the genocide against the Indians? And he said, well, we want them, we tell them to just come and join us, just come and join us and be a part of us, you know, why do you? Uh, you're you're Americans. They're Americans. You know, so that's a genocidal statement. Actually, you know, you don't but, but, exist. Yeah, you don't exist in your own right. Yeah, yeah but th- this is comes something you mentioned before. Uh, well, back to the Palestinians, uh, a one-state solution, which some people favor, uh, would very simply depend upon granting the Palestinians a a vote uh, over who governs them. This is something that seems to get lost all the time. Uh, And that uh, you you could have a a country in which you have a strong, maybe majority Jewish population, but you can't guarantee it. And that doesn't mean the Jewish population wouldn't break into different groups and make alliances with Christian and Muslim people and so forth, which you would expect. There's left and there's right and among the Jewish population as well as among the Palestinian, Arab, or Christian population. But this idea of, and it's interesting, you put it in the context of, of genocide, uh, an alternative to the killing of people and driving them into the desert or to concentration camps uh, it would be to at least guarantee the basic human right of individual power over your government through the vote. And and, and no one, very few people seem to discuss that now. Because I have to say, when I went there at the time of the Six-Day War and wrote about it for Ramparts and other things, at, at the time I thought there won't be a viable Palestinian state, really. And Israel will never accept what it said was this other boundary. What about one person, one vote? That gets lost all the time. Now, I don't think that leads to the disappearance of people, but it might mean they don't have a religious or ethnic basis to the power in their state. Uh, Are you suggesting that would be wrong? No. I think the thing is that um, we have a, a really heavy duty here in the United States because it would take United States backing and backing the UN to observe. You know, it would take um, what they finally did. You know, in, in South Africa, would um, the UN was much stronger then, but they um, didn't allow them to seat. You know, they kicked them out of the United Nations. And 
Israel is, you know, it's only when there's any kind of vote in the UN that is about human rights or anything, not just about Israel, there are two countries that oppose it in the General Assembly, Israel and the United States. So which of those are the strongest? You know, it ta- it's going to take us pushing our government. You know, the Palestinians have limited power to do that. It's to get off their neck, United States. You know, stop sending arms. Stop, you know, they give more aid to Israel per capita than any other country in the world. Sudan, start where people are starving. They, uh, and Israel, you know, really can only have profits because, you know, there's so much subsidizing of them. So that, uh, yes, one vote, uh, absolutely, but that means um, for the, empowering the Palestinians and Israel to change fundamentally. Uh, right, but I mean, taking it back to, to the Native American experience, that was sort of the cop-out, uh, as opposed to describing Native Americans in the Declaration of Independence as savages, that, uh, you know, which, which merciless, the, merciless, huh? savage. merciless savages, merciless, merciless <laughs> savages in our Declaration of Independence. I remember one time I exhibited Norman Lear, the great uh, man who changed television, had bought a copy of the Declaration of Independence and he uh, brought it to my class at USC. <laughs> we actually had one of the originals and he, you know, was showing around the country his intentions were, you know, that uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there and as in our constitution. And one of my students came up to me after and said, do you realize that Na- Native Americans are uh, uh, described as savages? And usually he didn't say mercy. And I said, you know what? Yeah. Uh, 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 I went and looked at it, the actual, you know, one of the original copies. And I said, my God, how come I didn't know that? I know. Uh, you, know, I, uh, I, you know, how come? And now until this moment, I didn't, uh, I've forgotten or didn't pay attention that it said merciless. Uh, yeah. But but the, the point is, at least in this country, once we ended segregation, uh, racial uh, segregation officially, uh, that uh, at least you could be incorporated. What I want to be clear about here is, and that's why I don't like getting that the whole issue should be around the use of this word genocide. And I think the settler colonial phenomena is really more illustrative of the problem that Israel is not willing to risk a democratic society in the sense of each person having equal worth as far as the political process. That is really the issue. It's the preservation of a Jewish majority, no matter its cost to Democrat, the basic democratic principle. And even the Palestinians in, in uh, Israel, when I visited, did not have anything like full rights. They were legal in what was the original territory of Israel, uh, but they, you know, uh, they gave their blood to the military. They were not allowed to be in the military. They uh, very, very severe limits uh, on their power. And so that is an aspect of this that in, in an odd way, at least Native Americans in this country came to have the choice of assimilation. Yeah, you know, it's a, you know, uh, 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 it, it's not something Israel has offered to people that they've held in their power for, what, seven decades now. Well, you know, for, for Native Americans, there's no such thing as a Native American or American Indian or an Indian. There, there are 500 different uh, nations. There are nations, they want to, many of them want to be nation states. They have not assimilated. They want their languages. They each have a different language, not a common language. They each have a different language. They each have different locations in, you know, from east to west, north to south. Um, They each have um, 
uh, different practices, you know. And so there is a, you know, they, they have come together, let's say, uh, just because there's a Council of Europe or a, a economic, you know, uh, gathering, those nations don't lose their specific uh, languages or, you know, even boundaries and so forth. So we have to understand that about Native Americans is they don't want to assimilate. That is what was proposed to them was give up the reservations and assimilate. And the, uh, in 1950s, 54, they terminated Native status. And this then uh, um, it actually... Um, caused an uprising. Uh, Native people have been, had been active, but they hadn't um, really ha- uh, made, uh, been able to organize themselves um, from the devastation and the genocide. Uh, and the boarding schools were still going on and, you know, they were losing their languages and all. So they rose up in... Um, uh, when this legislation was passed to terminate them. And it took them uh, from 1956 uh, mm-hmm. to 1975, um, including Wounded Knee and Alcatraz uprisings all over the country um, to get it reversed uh, with the Indian Self-Determination Act. And this um, this took enormous resistance. You know, the more than three hundred Native people uh, had felonies and misdemeanors after Wounded Knee. We had trials for several years. That's how I got involved with the Indian movement as an expert witness. I got recruited as an expert witness, and in seventy three seventy four, and um, that. So we, you know, got through um, a self determined and still and still in prison too. I mean, leaders of that. Oh yeah, Leonard Peltier. We, we should mention that. Why don't you prison. tell us? Well, about Leonard that Peltier, um, you know, with the, the American Indian Movement, um, was uh, uh, they were, you know, really the the um, uh, Pine Ridge uh, government was a, um, well, you know, the, the Lakota people say that um, there, you know, that there are these, um, what in Latin America they call caciques, and in, um, in Africa they call, um, I can't remember the term they use, but these are Native people who um, <coughs> align themselves. In India it was the Raj. Uh, that actually do the, you know, keep the people down. And that was an extreme situation at Wounded Knee where a dictator, literally a dictator who took away all rights um, and was, you know, supported by the Nixon administration. So they had the, you know, the Wounded Knee uprising to overthrow him and it was successful. They were able to overthrow him even though 300 people <laughs> had charges against them. Um, the leaders, uh, some of them had to serve a little time, but we actually got more than 350 of them um, freed, you know, through a, through a, a process um, in federal court. And I was involved in that. Well, and the FBI was uh, uh, complicit. Oh, the FBI and, was and, central, and, Yeah. And, yeah, and well, that was the police Indians. force. That was the police force of Indians is the FBI, you know, because it's a federal, it's a federal, federal colonies, basically. They're federal colonies. They don't have total self-determination. Um, they have their local governments and they've gotten more and more um, uh, power, like for um, uh, women who are raped or killed on the reservation used to be the FBI who did nothing to investigate it. So they really got through the Senate a um, 
that it would be um, that the uh, that the law enforcement people in the reservation could actually prosecute because they're not allowed to prosecute felonies. Indians aren't allowed by the um, uh, an act in 1890 or 1880 or so that still exists, only misdemeanors. So they have a limited power even to control anyone who comes onto the reservation. It's just a, you know, a bright red light saying, come here, any rapist, you know, or a pervert, you know, and do anything you want to to the women on the reservation, they're walking down a road and here comes someone, you know, who grabs them, puts them in the car and takes them off the reservation. And, and either, um, what's it called, you know, puts them into prostitution or um, just rapes them and leaves them or kills them. So this is a huge problem um, uh, that it has been taken up by Deb, um, Holland, you know, who's the Secretary of Interior now. She's from Isla de Pueblo in New Mexico. Uh, but we don't tell get, us what, I'm sorry, we don't get tell us much also, information of these things, you know. Right. And, and you know, I didn't mean before to say that assimilation was a, a good thing. It's, it's, it's better than being killed. Uh, it's, and you but it is, it, it is being killed. Right. It's your I'm, culture I'm being killed. Yeah. yeah, I'm endorsing your point and I'm criticizing <laughs> myself. Uh, but uh, the, the illusion that somehow settler colonialism should be accepted because we have casinos or you know, right. other manifestations yeah. of a thing is, is absurd. And I do want to connect it with the current, it's, it's, it's obviously current, this is around Thanksgiving or whatever. There, are, I think, don't we have the day after is now Native People's Day, or, or something? Well, that's in that's Columbus Day is turned into oh, Indigenous yeah. Peoples Day. Thanksgiving, I there's an un Thanksgiving. They're up at Alcatraz. They'll be at Alcatraz on the on Thursday. There's a gathering at Alcatraz that. Almost Indigenous Peoples Day, I think. No, is it? Well, I, I, in, no, I, Indigenous Peoples Day is in October. Oh, well, something yeah. popped up on my calendar. Yeah, because it's that, Columbus. Okay. Yeah, uh, but th okay. Thanksgiving so, is just on Thanksgiving, asking people. Right, to do. I don't mean to make light of this. The fact of the matter is, settler colonialism uh, is yes, it's it's as vicious as you can be because it aims at the denigration and elimination of a people, wherever you do it. Uh, and I, I want to return to the original point, you know, because uh, we're going to run out of time, but I, I can't understand for the life of me how the academic community, the mass media, and so forth has allowed uh, apologists uh, for the Netanyahu government, really, for uh, actually you know, a fairly extreme version of Zionism uh, to say that the re reference to settler colonialism, which has occurred, including in the United States, maybe most prominently at some point, uh, that we can't use the, this phrase. That's what I, I mean, if, if you say it in a classroom somewhere or something, then you are open to even lose your, your tenure. Uh, and, uh, you know, in uh, academic associations, have had fights about this. In fact, the communications field even stopped a Palestinian head of the organization from speaking out the other day. And they, you know, had to have their, when they had people reading their thing, had, I mean, I'm not going to go into that whole thing, but the, the chilling, uh, you know, makes McCarthyism sometimes seem mild, you yeah. know, at least when, uh, I mean, you and I were both. Well, well aware of what was going on under McCarthyism, there was a strong civil liberties uh, community in America that objected to McCarthyism, you know. Uh, but now, no, you can make a, a non-person uh, out of somebody who, so I want to, you know, as I said, interrogate this concept of settler colonialism. I don't want to lose this because yeah. that's the flashpoint right now. It is, we, yeah. And, and yet, 
frankly, it's, it's I don't how, understand how. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, there's a lot of um, a resonance, I think, in the U.S. Uh, white population, especially descendants of old settlers, which most of the presidents are, um, that they feel a resonance with Israel because of settler colonialism, because it is the, you know, it is the uh, imprint, the geographical imprint on U.S. people that settler colonialism is a good thing. Um, I have in in my books uh, several times, you know, in different places, I've quoted Obama, you know, our most Mm -hmm. liberal President well, I just want to be clear about which book, because I brought up before, the reason I uh, you wrote a book, at least was published uh, in Canada, right, uh, on settler colonialism. Yeah, well, uh, it's, that's a and, chapter, and 20, that's a chapter uh, from my um, Indigenous Peoples History uh, of the United States and also Not a Nation of Immigrants, which is okay, about so white supremacy wanna, and settler colonialism in the title. Yeah, so... Yeah, so, okay. um, so I, I just want to be clear. People listening to this who want to have a further exposition of this, that's where they should get it? Yes. Uh, Not a Nation of Immigrants is published uh, two years ago, and it's a Beacon Press, and it can be ordered on Amazon or, you know, the local bookstore. And it has that chapter in it, but also much else, you know, about immigration, yeah. the difference between immigration and settlers, you know, because settlers come to or already a populated, um, settlers come and want to take over the land. They want the land and no people. And immigrants come to an already existing polity and have to integrate themselves into it, assimilate into it to be, you know, a citizen. Uh, so that that's, a, you know, settler colonialism is inherently uh, uh, anti, you know, indigenous people, whoever they are. And it's a rare kind of colonialism in the, you know, days of, of, um, of colonialism. The... Um, just Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Uh, they were all Anglo because they'd already done settler colonialism in Northern Ireland. And they had that, it was very beneficial, you know, to have uh, their settlers controlling the land and people who might, you know, you know, rise up or do rise up. And with Native Americans, this is, you know, was... Um, uh, turned into just kill Indians, you know, kill the Indians, kill them. They're savages. They, they don't, you know, they're not humans. It's like killing an animal. Well, I'm an animal rights person. I don't think that's a right thing to do either. But um, this is, you know, settler colonialism is inherently, I still say, genocidal, inherently wants to get rid of the people who are there Whereas colonialism wants to make workers out of them, you know, uh, like the French in, in Southeast Asia and the... Um, but not the French in Algeria. Al- no, Algeria. the French, in, that's settler colonialism, you know. Yeah. That in, and in people Algeria. should remember that because Algeria is very important to the whole thinking of people in that region. Yeah. And this was, a, you know, people in the United States don't follow it as closely, uh, I've been in Algeria, though, uh, under different governments, and I've studied, thought about it. And you, you had a very large settler, French settler population Absolutely. of actually, you know, yeah, white people from France and and, and uh, basically Christian uh, moving into a Muslim uh, country, and it was one of the worst battles for people's freedom. Uh, costly in every which way, and the French were absolutely savage. If yeah, you can use that word, brutal. Uh, and and but something very simple. I mean, you know, there was an anti-colonial movement. The whole map of the Middle East was drawn by colonialists, uh, the colonizers. Right. And, and you know, the big thing that's left out about uh, in one of the in the battle was the fight over the Suez Canal, and yeah. and, and the attempt of the Egypt. 
under Nasser to nationalize it and so forth, resisted. And that's where Israel, I think, made its critical decision. Which side are you on? Because it, it and this is what the Six Day War had a lot to do with that people are forgetting, and maybe it's beyond what we're here to discuss. But you know, I, I, I was in Egypt at that time, and as well as in, in Israel, and the whole motivating thing uh, was really not the pal- freeing the Palestinians or uh, ending Israel. It was the French and, and English, with support from the United States at a critical time, and Israel, uh, to prevent the government from Egypt from controlling its major asset, which was the canal. Right. That was the issue. It hardly ever comes up in any discussion of what was this tension all about. And Israel, which had a, a strong left, particularly in the Kibbutzim movement and people who were actually even officers. I think at one point, 70% of the Israeli officer corps had come from the Kibbutz movement. And there was an idealism. Uh, People tell me I'm naive about this, but I interviewed a lot of these people, uh, high and low at that time, who were committed, they said, not to be colonizers. (laughs) Not, you know, they understood that this was the path uh, to fascism. You know, there was a common thing to observe. It was, you know, even a movie like The Gatekeepers, which I keep trying to get people to watch, uh, where it's all interviews with Shin Bet leaders, the people who administered the West Bank and Gaza, uh, but generally came out of the Labor Party. And they said, this is the end of, 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 of the notion of a democratic Israel. Uh, 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 this kind of occupation. Well, at the time of the Six Day War, that was, uh, uh, you, you, you know, people understood when I asked questions about that, they they lectured me about it, the danger. That's all gone now. And that's where I think the settler colonialism uh, issue is decisive because really, what kind of Israel are you talking about? Why? And I get back to that one person, one vote. You know, uh, yeah. you know why? What? What are you really talking about? And you know, I'm, I'm, anyway, we're going to wrap this up. But every time I talk to you, I learn so much about what I don't know. Well, I learned from know. you. <laughs> and, you no, know, but the idea that I didn't know that word "merciless savage" is in the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. No, really, it's a self. I don't know what it is. You know, uh, why we don't learn? Why it didn't stick? I must have yeah. looked at that sentence a, a thousand times, you know, and, and, and uh, yes, this is, this nation was founded on, and then when you hear the language now about other people being less than human, yes, that's an invitation, uh, yes, to, to ethnic cleansing, to genocide, yes, yes. Uh, so I want to thank you yeah. for the, you Once could. again, uh, and what, now if they're going to read one book of yours, which I think everybody should read, it isn't the Canadian version of settler colonialism that I was going to recommend. So tell us now, how does one uh, get not more? A, not a nation Some of is, yeah. Go ahead. Not a nation of immigrants. Uh, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and a history of. Uh, something, but it's a long subtitle. <laughs> okay, but not a nation uh, not, of immigrants. Not, yeah, we've talked about it in the past. Not a nation of immigrants, and it's the reality. Again, connecting it's, it to Thanksgiving. It's really Syria. yeah. The whole the whole book is really about settler colonialism and how it it functions. And I bring up these analogies with Israel and Australia. And okay, Zealand. not a nation of immigrants is compulsory. Thanksgiving weekend or Indigenous Peoples Weekend uh, reading, not a nation of immigrants. And the whole fantasy about the immigrants just remind people who, you know, that, that I, I still can't believe it. I, 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 as a kid, I remembered my mother dragged me, my Jewish <laughs> garment worker mother dragged me to Washington to picket the White House with the slogan, open the second front to get the United States to go get involved in the war uh, and and uh, to stop 
uh, the genocide and and yeah. the, you know and the experience of actually Jewish refugees turned away uh, by our government and with a president that I as a kid oh. certainly admired. Uh, there's complex history, and, but when you're bent on ethnic cleansing, and when your government supports it, you know we forget about complexity. It's an inconvenience. All right, thank you, thank uh, you. Roxanne. Thank you. Dumbra Ortiz, and uh, with this is another edition of Sheer Intelligence. I want to thank Laura Kandarajian and Christopher Ho at KCRW, the lively public radio station in Santa Monica, for hosting these shows. Joshua Shear, our producer, uh, who insisted on doing this interview with you, I might add, and who has met you. Uh, Diego Ramos, uh, who does the introduction and is uh, Shear. Uh, post uh, managing editor Max Jones, who does the in, uh, video, and the JKW Foundation in memory of Gene Stein, a terrific uh -huh. writer, very close to Edward Said, and one of the few people and all through this history since the Six Day War when I, I first met her, who actually said, What about the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. Gene Stein, this is a good time to remember her. Okay, thank you. Take Thank care. You.